Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us this afternoon for this webinar on the investment implications of COVID-19. I'm Kylie Wilmot, Chief Investment Officer for Mercer in the Pacific. It's actually our second webinar on how to navigate these extraordinary times. So welcome back to those of you who joined us a few weeks ago. Uh, certainly a lot has happened in the world since then. And because this market uncertainty might persist for some time and there's so much to cover, we've decided to host a series of weekly webinars over the next four weeks. Each week we'll provide you with a market update, give you some thoughts on managing portfolios through these times and put the spotlight on specific asset classes. Starting with fixed interest this week, then equities next week, real assets, and then finally liquid alternatives. So if you've registered for this webinar, you'll be all automatically registered for all four and we hope you can continue to join us. Also note that a recording and slides from today will be provided by email in the coming days. I truly hope that you and your family and colleagues are all well and safe and that you're managing to navigate the many personal and professional challenges we're all facing at the moment. Uh, we are coming to you from our homes uh, all in Sydney today, as I'm sure most of you are in your own homes. So I do apologise in advance if our home Wi-Fi or background noises um, provide any disruption today. A shout out to our friends across the ditch in New Zealand. You are very well represented in the uh, registrations for today. And so we hope that you're all adjusting well to life in lockdown. Uh, next slide, please. Sam, if we can just go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so I am very fortunate to be joined by uh, a panel of subject matter experts today. As a team, we are all very much at the cold base of managing our portfolios through these extreme times, and we're happy to share some of these insights with you today. Firstly, our Head of Investment Strategy, Guion Moore, will provide a market update. Then Ronan McCabe, our Head of Portfolio Management, will talk through some of the things you might be wanting to think about from a portfolio management perspective. And finally, Sue Wang, our Senior Fixed Interest Portfolio Manager, will take us through some of the specific challenges and opportunities that we're seeing in fixed interest markets. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end, so the, the questions can be submitted um, at any time using the, the Q&A icon, which if you're on a laptop is it on the bottom of your screen. Um, I have noticed if you're on a, an iPhone or other device, it pops up at the top. So submit those in at any time and we'll make sure that we pick them up at the end. Uh, but for now, I will pass on to Guion for the market update. Thanks, Guion. Oh, hello. Thank you, Kylie. Um, and thank you, everyone who's um, joined us on the call. I hope the sound is OK and there's not too much background noise. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the pandemic, uh, the efforts to contain it, the implications for the global, uh, global economy and the risks and opportunities in financial markets. Um, now, on this slide, we see a chart from the Financial Times that shows the growth in the confirmed cases of coronavirus through time by country. Each, the number of cases in each country is on the vertical axis and the number of days since the 100th case in the horizontal axis. Um, the graph is logarithmic, meaning that each step, step up on the vertical axis is much larger than the last. The first thing that is apparent is that the number of cases is growing rapidly. Worldwide, we expect to cross over a million confirmed cases in the next uh, two days. But also that as containment measures are implemented, the pace of growth of the pandemic is slowing. The rate of increase is declining. The, the lines are curving to the right. And that some countries have been more successful than others in containing, containing the pandemic, particularly South Korea, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Those are shown in blue on the chart, uh, perhaps reflecting their particular experiences in managing the SARS outbreak. Uh, while other countries are facing larger challenges and uh, the focus of the pandemic has now shifted to Europe and the US. The good news is that in most economies, the number of daily new infections appears to be stabilizing, albeit at uncomfortably high levels. So the containment measures that have been pursued around the world are having an effect in, of slowing the pandemic and saving lives. Um, and while it's unlikely we're gonna see a vaccine in the near future, the science and technology around testing to see who has active infections, who has antibodies from prior infections and, now, and is now immune are progressing rapidly. Similarly, there is a growing, hope around, a growing hope around certain treatment protocols and the old malaria uh, chloroquine has been a topic of focus recently. 
Uh, these advances open up the potential for a more focused and less restrictive approach to managing the pandemic. However, for now, the policies to contain the pandemic are having an unprecedented impact on economic activity. Uh, could we step over to the next slide? Uh, the, the speed and the extent of the economic shutdown is unprecedented in, economic, in, in modern history, um, and the impact has been dramatic. The graph here shows uh, initial jobless claims in the US, a measure of the newly unemployed. Um, last week's print was 3.3 million, and this is the equivalent of three months job losses in one week, simply off the scale compared to the, uh, previous events such as the GFC or the 1970s and 80s oil shocks. Um, we would expect to see a similar dramatic deterioration in economic statistics over coming months. And in some ways, for the time being, economic data is of less use than it has been in the past, just reflecting the fast pace of events and the slow pace of economic statistics. We do expect a deep recession across the developed world, obviously with some areas of business being more impacted than others, airlines, retailers, hospitality, etc. The question we really face is not whether there will be a recession, but how long and how deep it will be and what will be the character of the recovery. And it's there that the economic policy, the responses are key. Uh, could I step on to the next slide? Uh, the depth and magnitude of the, um, of the economic shock um, has been matched by an extraordinary policy response. And not just the usual stuff, not just in, you know, central banks taking interest rates down to zero, or further quantitative easing, or the Federal Reserve expanding the scope of the discount window, or being granted new powers to buy corporate bonds. But also fiscal policymakers, our governments have shifted very quickly to provide wartime levels of fiscal support whether it be salary support for the newly unemployed, incentives to retain, retain employees, uh, rent and mortgage holidays, or credit support for businesses of all sizes. Uh, the chart on this slide shows the combined growth in the US deficit and, and Federal Reserve balance sheet through time. Uh, the step up at the end is, is the two trillion in fiscal stimulus, 10% uh, of GDP recently approved by the US Congress. Uh, for Australia, it's even larger, a 15% fiscal stimulus is expected. The whatever it takes approach has had the impact of placing a floor or, or maybe a cushion under the potential economic outcomes during this emergency period and provide a basis for a stronger return to growth once the crisis is over. It's also substantially reduced but not eliminated the risks of, of a GFC style financial crisis. Although we now have the new problem of how to eventually unwind the emergency measures. Policymakers are effectively trying to put the economy on pause for a few months um, uh, while, we hope, uh, while we hope that the, uh, the threat of the pandemic lessens and in turn provide a basis for a more robust recovery at the second half of 2020 and running into 2021. Um, can we skip over on to the next slide? Um, in terms of the market's response to the events, well, I think you've seen both in the newspapers and maybe on your Bloomberg machines what's been going on. Um, at first, I think the markets were quite slow to react to the threat of the pandemic, considering it primarily a Chinese phenomenon. But with the growth in the outbreak in Italy, markets have caught up in ferocious style. Uh, the chart on this slide shows the MSCI World Equity Index and the VIX Volatility Index over the past year or so. Uh, from its peak, the MSCI World fell over 30% from its highs, um, while the VIX rose to levels that exceeded the worst of the GFC. We saw extreme levels of intraday volatility, with the S&P rising and falling 10% day on day for several days in a row. The markets were in free fall, rejecting the usual stabilizing policy measures of interest rate cuts, and at least in the US, more QE. It wasn't until we started to see the size of the fiscal support measures introduced by governments that volatility started to decline. I mean, obviously we've had a, a huge relief rally over the past week. Uh, and there are some legitimate causes for concern, uh, for, for, for optimism, which I, I've mentioned before. The stabilisation in the number of new cases in many regions, the steady advance of science and the magnitude of the economic support. Uh, however, we think it's probably stu still too early to say this is over. The pandemic will take a course over which we only have some control uh, and not all the economic costs can be eliminated. And there's always the risk of more surprises to come. Uh, we expect the environment of heightened volatility will persist for some time. Uh, but like any time of volatility in markets, risk also creates opportunities. Uh, could I move on to the next slide? 
Um, one of these opportunities is maybe inflation expectations. The difference in yield between a conventional bond and an inflation linked bond. Naturally, at the moment, there is uncertainty in debate about how the balance of the enormous demand shock we're experiencing and the enormous supply shock plus unprecedented money printing will play out. Some worry that further disinflation or, or deflation will occur, while others are worried about the potential for higher inflation. The chart on this page shows the five US five-year interest rate and inflation expectations. It can be seen that the pandemic has led to a substantial decline in interest rates. And this has in large part been driven by a decline in inflation expectations. So at the moment, at least, the markets are coming down strongly on the side of a disinflationary or potentially deflationary scenario um, versus that of an inflationary outcome. Um, obviously, right now, we're all experiencing personally some kind of relative price inflation. Uh, the price of fresh food is up in Australia, while the cost of refilling your car is down. Uh, but based on the market's forecast, you have to say that we're looking at a weakening in the inflation environment yet again. Um, although that may only be a temporary effect, and we suspect um, that as the, uh, as the recovery takes hold, we should start to see inflation expectations rise again, um, and that inflation-linked bonds will outperform conventional bonds. Uh, can I move on to the next page? Yes, next equity market. So obviously we've had a huge sell-off. Um, and the question is, is this an opportunity or a risk? Um, this chart shows the forward price to earnings ratio for notable US indices, uh, notable equity indices, the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. Uh, it's a kind of a measure of value of equity markets. Uh, prior to the onset of the pandemic, most developed world equity markets were at or near post-dot-com bubble highs for valuations. The sell-off over the past months has seen a significant decline in valuations, but equity markets are not cheap by historical standards, although these are certainly better entry levels we have now over a two to three year horizon than we have had uh, 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 until recently. Um, at this stage, we're not bullish on equities yet and are maintaining a more neutral position for the time being. Uh, can I move on to the, on to the next slide? Uh, one, of, one of the areas we really do see opportunity right now is uh, in credit spreads. Uh, the chart on this slide shows the, uh, the history of investment grade and high yield credit spreads over the last 20 years. Spreads have widened to levels not seen si since the GFC. Uh, given the levels of fiscal and monetary support, including the Federal Reserve's new powers to buy investment grade corporate bonds, we think current spread levels present an attractive entry level for long term investors which is not to say that there won't be challenges. High yield is certainly certain to have an upswing in defaults, but spread levels are wide enough to compensate for that risk over a horizon of one to two years. Uh, and so there is a compelling opportunity. Um, I might take the opportunity to leave off now uh, and hand over to my colleague, Ronan McKay, who will be talking a bit about managing portfolios in this difficult environment. And I hope there'll be some questions at the end. Goyan. Um Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first off, just want to echo his colleague's comments and say that I hope you and your loved ones are all staying safe and keeping well in these uh, unprecedented times. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about navigating uncertainty and the importance of diversification in portfolios. In times like this, it is important to have a framework in place to navigate through uncertainty. Firstly, it's important to stay on track. What I mean by this is to stick with your objectives, what you expect from your portfolio of the long over the long term. These may be return and risk objectives or liquidity objectives or ultimately what, what you're expecting from your portfolio to achieve over time and what its purpose is. For example, despite the recent market moves, current drawdowns are within expectations for most multi-sector funds. A 50-50 growth defensive fund has experienced a drawdown of around negative 2% fall over the last 12 months to the end of March. And this compares to a max drawdown tolerance of 10% of such a fund. So now is not the time to panic, but rather stay on track to meet your long-term goals. Next, it's important to revisit your investment beliefs. These are the core beliefs you have in how portfolio should be managed in capital investment. And these should stand the test of time. At Mercer, we're constantly checking, especially at this time, our current portfolios to be managed in accordance with our investment beliefs, which are around risk management, active management, dynamic asset allocation, operational efficiency and sustainability. 
And finally, it's important to be aware of unwanted risks. These are risks that reside in portfolios that are not intended, may not be evident until suddenly they are, such as unintentional FX or market exposures, not fully hedging a position, operational risks, governance risks, liquidity versus illiquidity mismatches, and higher levels of correlation in what seems like uncorrelated investments. As mentioned, one of Mercer's core investment beliefs is operational efficiency, which we see as high quality investment operations and implementations being critical in realizing a successful investment outcome. Operational efficiency, now more than ever, should be a core focus for all investors to mitigate unwanted and unintended risks. Moving to the next slide, Sam. So I want to spend the next few minutes talking about diversification. We believe that not giving up on diversification is key at this time. We believe diversification is a key part of building robust portfolios. We think of diversification across three layers, across asset classes, within asset classes, and finally within portfolios themselves. Firstly, across asset classes, part of Mercer's investment beliefs is diversification. You know, so spreading investments across different investment types and risks to mitigate periods such as this of market volatility and to provide some downside risk protection. For some time, we've been diversifying beyond the equities and sovereign bonds in our portfolios, to include other asset classes such as growth, fixed interest, liquid alternatives, and private and real assets. We believe that this approach works well in a market environment such as the one we are currently in. Within asset classes, Within asset classes, we believe there are smarter ways to build single asset class portfolios. Looking at equities, for example, something we've had in our portfolios for quite a while and has worked is low volatility equity. This is a way of capturing equity risk premium but with lower volatility than broad equity exposures. And over the recent market movements, low volatility equities have fallen about 20 to 30% less than broad global equities. Similarly, global SRI, is another equity strategy that's done well relative to broad equities recently, where the underlying companies have a slightly more defensive and high quality tilt, as well as sustainable aspect to them. Similarly, within fixed interest, diversification within that asset class can be achieved by allocating across global sovereign, global credit, absolute return bond, and emerging market debt. Finally, diversification within portfolios are given sub asset class, such as global equities, global sovereign bond is a key aspect of how we build portfolios. We think about building multi-manager portfolios with the concept that every single manager has a unique role in the portfolio and we constantly test that the managers are adhering to expectations that we have around their role in the portfolio. We believe that all investors should be doing the same, something similar in their portfolios. Why you may ask? Well, we can believe that continuing to pursue active management, we, this is what we expect from all investors, Continue to pursue active management and asset classes at this time can offer the greatest opportunity for skilled, high conviction investment managers to add value. Diversification across the manager can lead to better risk adjusted returns, as well as lead to more stable returns within a given asset class, such as fixed interest or sub asset class, such as equity or emerging market equities. So, to quickly summarize in navigating these uncertain times, stay on track with your objectives, revisit your investment beliefs. Be aware of unwanted and unintended risks and don't give up on diversification. With that, I'll pass over to Sue, who will talk about the fixed interest markets. Okay, thank you, Ronan. Um, I want to thank everyone who's joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm well aware we're all being bombarded with conference calls at the moment, so we certainly appreciate your time and attention today. I really just want to spend a couple of minutes discussing three key areas of focus for us in our fixed income funds and in the, in the markets. Um, these are liquidity correlations and opportunities. If I start with liquidity, and whilst I was preparing for this webinar yesterday, I was reminded of Ruth Porat's quote, liquidity is oxygen for a financial system. And if that is indeed the case, then we certainly saw that oxygen evaporate through much of March. Um, put simply, selling and even buying securities became very difficult, as dealers were unwilling and perhaps unable to open up their balance sheets. Trading costs rose significantly as a result. At its worst, which was probably in the week of March 16, transaction costs were 10 to 20 times normal levels. This was across all fixed income assets, including developed market government bonds. The cons consistent comment that I received from fund managers and traders alike 
was that liquidity was worse than at the height of the GFC. That's because what we're facing now is a human, financial and political crisis all rolled into one. Since mid-March, central banks around the world have implemented a number of policy initiatives. This has improved liquidity in some fixed income markets, such as government bonds and high quality corporate credit. But liquidity overall remains challenged in most fixed income markets. This liquidity squeeze saw many fixed income funds, including a number of the MERS specific funds, increase their buy sell spreads. This is a prudent thing to do in order to protect remaining investors whilst providing liquidity to exiting clients. I know that liquidity and thus transaction costs are fluid, if you will pardon the pun, and we continue to assess the appropriateness of these spreads. Next slide, please. This liquidity squeeze brings me to my to second topic for today, which is basically correlations and the continued need for diversification within our portfolios. And for this, I'm going to impress you with Jeff Yass's quote, which is, if you invest and don't diversify, you're literally throwing away money. Now that comment and that quote could was easily challenged through the middle part of March, but by the end of last month, um, I think that there are elements of that quote that came to, to the fore again. So as we all know, smack bang in the middle of March, we saw a significant breakdown of normal correlations between government bonds and risk assets. Ordinarily, you'd expect to see developed market government bonds do well during a crisis as investors flock to safe haven assets. However, throughout much of March, investors had been selling government bonds to raise cash in their portfolios. Whilst investors' preference for liquidity is common in such environments, this time, the demand for cash was global and across all asset classes, which in turn led to a massive amount of government bond sales. This, in turn, led to a fall in government bond prices at the same time as equity markets were falling. The central bank programs I mentioned earlier have sought to address this problem with unprecedented large scale purchases of government bonds, as well as other fixed income assets. Thus far, these programs appear to be working. In particular, developed market government bond markets have started to stabilize and liquidity has certainly improved. This has seen government bonds retrace some of the intramonth losses and end the month in positive territory. Next slide, please, Sam. And finally, a man who needs no introduction, Mr. Warren Buffett. I'm turning to our, our last topic, which is opportunities that we're seeing in the market. And, and Mr. Buffett has widely spoken about the fact that great investment opportunities come around when excellent companies are surrounded by unusual circumstances that cause the stock to be misappraised. And we are certainly seeing some misappraising potentially going on right now. Um, these are predominantly within the credit space as spreads have blown out dramatically since the beginning of the year. In particular, high yield corporate bonds sold off significantly in March. Concerns around disruptions to commerce and the price war in oil markets have driven spreads in global high yield to north of 800 basis points and US high yield to above 1,000 basis points. These spread levels are in the 90 plus percentile since the year 2000. Whilst the energy sector has certainly been the key driver of this spread winding, other sectors such as transportation and consumer cyclicals have also suffered. At current spreads, high yield bonds are certainly starting to look attractive and imply a default scenario far worse than that experienced during the GFC. Having said that, we are cognizant of the potential further downside risk. As I stated earlier, this crisis is unprecedented in many ways and much depends on how long commercial activity remains suppressed. Our current views on high yield bonds are covered in our recently published white papers, Time to Buy, High Yield Debt, and Braving the Unknown, US High Yield Debt. If you have not received a soft copy of these papers, please do reach out to your consultant. Another potential area of opportunity is investment grade credit. Spreads have also widened dramatically from around 90 basis points at the start of the year to north of 300 basis points. Current spreads are around the 95th percentile since the year 2000. However, we remain more cautious on investment grade credit as its composition has changed markedly since the GFC. With triple B rated credits, that is the lowest investment grade credit rating, now making up 50% of that index compared to around 26% 10 years ago. In other words, the index is now much riskier and thus historical spread comparisons are less relevant. And lastly, 
one would be remiss not to mention the potential opportunity arising in distressed debt. We have not had a proper distress cycle in many years as cheap liquidity kept many businesses afloat. However, the current crisis looks certain to bring about the demise of many businesses. This will bring both stressed and distressed opportunities to debt managers. So on that very positive note, I'll conclude my fixed income update and pass back to Kylie for Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. That's great. And thanks to all of our speakers today uh, for their insight. So just a couple of things on the Q&A before I throw the questions out. I have noticed that questions aren't coming through on the Q&A function. I'm not sure whether that means it's not working. Um, so please feel free to try and post your questions there. If for some reason that's not working, um, you can post them up in the chat because that's where I am seeing questions come through. So we will pick, I will pick them up from, from either of those places. Um, I also noticed there are some people who've raised their hands. So perhaps instead of raising hand, if we can get you to pop your question either in the Q&A um, or the chat, that, that would be great. Actually, I've got a question coming through on the Q&A now, so it, it does appear to be to be working. All right, um, Guion, I might turn the first question to you. Um, there is a question here just around the oil price, um, hasn't come up a lot today. Um, so the question's really asking around, um, you know, how, how the oil price might further impact the timeline to recovery, overall scenario predictions, uh, especially if oil prices go negative because of lack of storage. Um, and a number of oil majors and big market players uh, start to stall or, or fail. So maybe you can just provide some comments around mm. the oil price and its poten potential impact. Uh, yes, th thank you, Kylie. So, so I, I discussed the, um, the initial oil shock um, from the breakdown of OPEC in our last call. Um, and it was very much the driver, the, one, one of the prime drivers behind the um, collapse in break-even inflation. Um, since then, I think the price of oil has declined from about $30 a barrel uh, down to $20 a barrel. Uh, and there are growing storage difficulties uh, across the uh, sort of the, the, the oil or the energy complex. Uh, we're even facing the situation where pipelines are running the risk of filling up. Uh, that, um, that leads obviously to the situation where we might find ourselves with producers having to pay people to store um, their oil, effectively uh, making the price of oil potentially negative. Um, I think at the moment, like the main area this is impacting the economy will be um, one, inflation expectations, where that's already largely been incorporated, or maybe there's more to go, uh, but also um, in high yield spreads and high yield def uh, defaults around uh, the US shale producers. Um, we had a similar situation in 2015, which had a more favourable resolution. Um, naturally, this is very much dependent on the length of the shutdown. Um, at current levels, I think high yield spreads are sufficient to cover for um, you know, some months in shutdown and a high level of default from energy producers in high yield is already anticipated. Um, but if we go much beyond that, then you know, effectively we're into another game. So I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll sign off there. Okay, thanks, Guion. Uh, Sue, I've got a couple here for you, so I might just give you both of them at the same time, if you can maybe pick them up one after the other. Um, one's asking about transaction costs in fixed interest markets and, and why they um, increase so substantially during March. And then the second one, is around, um, you know, if credit's dropping below the minimum credit rating of a mandate, causing a mandate breach, how should investors approach this? Okay, I believe I've unmuted myself now. Okay, transaction costs. Um, yes, a hotly debated topic, um, almost on a daily basis at the moment. And I tried to cover a little bit of that in my um, liquidity section. Why do they rise so sharply? Um, Put simply, it's because no one wanted to trade anything. Certainly no one wanted to buy anything. And so when that happens and, um, and dealers who traditionally can house securities on their balance sheets aren't able to do so, then it drastically increases the cost to do any activity in the market. It mostly affected, um, you know, in, in an odd way, uh, sovereign, developed market sovereign bond markets, because there was such widespread selling of these securities. And um, most um, 
dealers would often take this on the balance sheet and then hedge them using derivatives. Unfortunately, the derivative markets shut down too during the middle of March. And so as a consequence, they were unable to take much inventory onto their own balance sheets. Um, since, I guess, the central bank um, intervention, we have seen significant falls in trading costs in, as I mentioned earlier, developed market government bonds and also some high-grade corporates. They are um, shifting again, they are moving. The spreads are not quite at normal levels, but they are probably a half to a third of the, um, the extreme levels that had reached in the middle of March. Um, you know, to put into context, you can easily trade Australian government bonds with, um, a, you know, um, a transaction cost sort of spread of between three and five basis points. Um, with global sovereigns, depending on the market, it's probably in the low teens still. Um, these are still significantly better numbers than we were witnessing um, a week or two ago. Um, hopefully that addresses the, the transaction cost issue. There are markets that are still very liquid. Investment grade credit is still incredibly illiquid with the exception of very high grade names. Um, in, in, in that case, yes, there are transactions going and in, indeed the primary markets have reopened. Last week with some quite large US deals getting done. Um, but I think it remains a moving feast and um, you know, until we see some genuine stabilization in markets and in, in, you know, in the current situation, I don't think we're gonna get an ungoing of, of liquidity um, back to normal conditions. Um, so Kylie, given my fish brain, I can't quite remember the, the second question now. There was a transaction cost. Oh yes, investment yeah. grade downgrades. Yeah. Sorry, what, sorry, sorry. What do you do with credits that, that start to breach your mandate? Okay, so my understanding is, uh, is that most mandates would have some flexibility for what we, what we call fallen angels, for securities that have fallen from investment grade to sub-investment grade. Um, and usually it's like a small allowance of, you know, up to 5% of the portfolios allowed to be in these secu um, securities simply to, to protect against um, forced selling in that regard. Many mandates will also have, you know, written into them the fact that yes, um, we'll accept fallen um, angels, but managers will, will need to, you know, rid, rid them in the portfolio over uh, a period of time. So I would say that there should not be indiscriminate, immediate selling of these so-called fallen angels. And indeed, um, a comment that I made earlier about the um, attractiveness or, or, or lack thereof of investment grade credit is that that index and that market is now very, very much dominated by lower rated credits. 50% of that index is triple B i.e. the lowest investment grade rating. And so the, you know, the possibility of fallen angels is much higher than previous cycles when triple B's only made up 20, 30% of that index. So I think this is something we, we, you know, we all have had to prepare ourselves for. Um, but I would be engaging with my manager. I would be asking them which ones remain money good uh, which ones are genuine concerns in the portfolio and only looking to work out or sell those that are genuine concerns, where you are able to hold on to fallen angels that remain money good, in the opinion of your fund manager, my sense is that, um, you know, it, it should be more of a, of, a, of a hold but watch position. Hopefully that answers that question, Kylie. Thanks, Sue. Uh, there's one here sort of asking a, a little bit more of a practical question around uh, what do you do if your portfolio is moving away from its strategic asset allocation? So it's kind of a rebalancing question. I might pick that that one up. Um, I think what we'd be saying to investors is, you know, maintaining your rebalancing, uh, you know, discipline in these kind of markets is important, but taking a slightly different approach uh, is probably necessary. So what I would say first and foremost is think about your liquidity requirements if you have them. Uh, that's probably very relevant for superannuation funds in Australia at the moment who perhaps have heightened liquidity needs around uh, perhaps members switching options or early release payments as part of the government support package. Um, I would suggest that investors both in Australia and New Zealand may have currency hedges that they're needing to, to fund losses on. So think about your liquidity requirements first and foremost, because if you wanting to rebalance um, you know, your equity position, for example, as it's moved underweight, you obviously need to source that from, from somewhere and that may very well be cash that you're needing to, to pay out you know, over the next, you know, the coming weeks or so. So think about li your liquidity needs first. Um, and then from there, we would say, you know, we want to 
sort of avoid over trading in very whippy markets. So if you have quite tight rebalancing ranges, that can cause you to be, you know, buying one day, selling the next, buying one day, selling the next. We want to avoid that, particularly in an environment where transaction costs are heightened. So we have been saying to investors perhaps to widen their rebalancing ranges somewhere in the vicinity of plus minus um, 5% probably feels about right or it may be a little bit dependent on your particular circumstances. But if you are sort of getting up to that plus minus 5% away from your strategic allocation, we would, and you've, you've factored in your liquidity requirements, we would suggest that you do undertake rebalancing and take advantage really of those um, favourable levels that are there in order to, to top up your allocations. Um, we'd suggest perhaps not topping up the, the whole way. Um, a lot of our clients have been topping up and, and some of the advice that's come out from Mercer based on the, the global financial crisis experience is that if you top up roughly half, um, sometimes the market will take you the rest of the way um, and you, again, you, you sort of help to avoid that over trading situation if you go back to full FAA and then you end up overweight uh, depending on the market move. So they're probably the broad comments we'd make around um, rebalancing. Um, just looking through some of the other questions we've got here, um, Ronan, I might um, pass one over to you. So it, it's really sort of asking around the the manager performance um, and oversight piece. So, you know, how do you interpret you know, whether managers have done well or poorly through this time and, and how what's the right kind of oversight to make sure that the managers are, um, you know, behaving, I guess, as, as we would expect. Are, are you happy to elaborate on that one? Yeah, sure. So um, as, as I kind of touched upon earlier on, so in, in terms of how we think about, um, you know, building portfolios, you know, every single manager should, you know, even before this, position for every single manager, you should be very clear on what the role of every single manager is in a portfolio. So you should have different ways of testing how to, that, that is. So within equities, if you have a manager that is, for example, more of a value manager, they, they will have kind of underperformed in a period like this. If it's a manager that, um, I think they probably one of the kind of key things will be managers maybe that we haven't seen it yet to have a kind of style drift. Or, you know, if you have a quantitative manager and all of a sudden they've switched off their um, algorithms and are making fundamental or discretionary uh, inputs into models, that's obviously kind of something to kind of um, um, a bit of a flag. In terms of the ongoing, you know, onside, I think it is very much in a period like this, you know, notwithstanding the managers that are actually facing, um, you know, the volatility in the markets is very much, which we've been doing is frequent communication, very regular communication with the managers you know, don't panic. Um, we, you know, managers are hired for a particular reason, but kind of very much staying on top that, you know, there's nothing too dramatic in terms of moving away and, you know, staying on track in terms of what they should be doing. Um, where managers have had dramatic uh, underperformance versus a particular benchmark or an index, trying to delve in it, but with the manager, but also independently um, trying to assess, you know, what, what this is from. Is this maybe kind of some unintended risks at the manager's end? Is it unintended risks maybe at, um, at you know at the investors end or, or, or our end, is there things like in our portfolios that you know have the managers been actually somewhat more correlated to a particular scenario than we've envisaged? Notwithstanding that, I think everyone agrees that this particular situation with the coronavirus COVID nineteen is is very much um, you know black swan. No one quite expected it. Um, so it, it is it's it is all about kind of communication with the managers both ways, and um, very much them on you know informing and staying in contact and letting you know uh, what's going on in their portfolios, uh, but also, um, you know, your communication comes the other way in terms of kind of, you know, understand the managers, what, what, what you're thinking is beginning to be so they can kind of get a sense of if there's any kind of changes in their portfolios that need to come down the tracks. Oh. Okay, thanks, Ronan. Um, Guyan, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, and there's probably a, a few questions that are relevant here. For you, there's a couple that are sort of drawing comparisons with the Great Depression, um, asking whether markets have, you know, priced this in. Um, you know, how, how does this period compare, and is it a, a fair scenario um, for us to be thinking about? Um, so that's probably part A of the question, um, and then part B, sort of around 
which, which is perhaps on a little bit of a similar theme, but it's around the government stimulus. Um, is it enough? Uh, who's going to pay for it? Or does it matter? Sort of alluding to a bit of a, an MMT type environment from from here. So maybe if you can answer that question in two parts, one being around the comparison with the Great Depression and the other one around the levels of stimulus and how that plays out as we look forward. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I think those are two very good questions. Um, starting with the Great Depression. Um, so I think obviously the, the, the economic shock we've had, the instantaneous economic shock, is much greater than what was experienced during the Great Depression, um, much faster and much more intense. Uh, but also our understanding of how the economy works, uh, the institutions we have in place, both in terms of our governments and our central banks, are much more sophisticated than they were then. Uh, and you can see that in just the, uh, obviously the policy response was a bit slow, uh, at least on the scale, time scales of the pandemic to begin with, uh, but caught up in quite, in quite uh, astonishing style with um, some uh, uh, levels of fiscal stimulus that have uh, actually astounded myself. Um, so in terms of is there a Great Depression scenario here? Yes, absolutely, there is the potential for it. Um, standing against that scenario is the enormous level of policy response to support the economy and financial markets. The danger is that there is some kind of policy error, um, maybe a collapse of solidarity within the European Union uh, leads to a, a, a resurgent of the resurgence of the euro crisis that we had, I think, perhaps uh, seven to eight years ago. Uh, something of that kind, an institutional breakdown is probably the risk rather than, uh, than the situation that occurred during the Great Depression where uh, policymakers were essentially flying blind, working out what to do as they went along, and in many cases, making uh, uh, wrong policy decisions. In terms of the, um, the, the magnitude of the fiscal stimuluses, and will they be enough? Uh, that's, that's, I mean, that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, part of it, of course, is that um, we don't know exactly how bad this is going to be in terms of the economic shock. Uh, I see forecasters coming up with uh, you know, a, a widespread of large negative numbers for, uh, for Q2 GDP pro uh, projections. Um, I think it's going to be as much about the unwind um, and the length of, of the situation. Um, if we find this going on, there's going to be an enormous a lot of, a, amount of pressure to try and return to normal economic activity. Um, the decision how to weigh the trade-offs between uh, continued lockdown or containment measures combined with fiscal stimulus against the urge to get people back to work and to get the economy going is a political decision uh, and will be dealt with, I think, individually by countries. Uh, in terms of where does the money come from, um, well, <laughs> Uh, had had uh, Mercer's Global Investment Forum in Melbourne gone ahead, you would have had the pleasure of seeing myself and Sue debate uh, modern monetary theory. Um, and the essential argument there is that governments aren't restrained in their ability to spend uh, so long as inflation remains under control. Uh, in my previous slides, I showed uh, where inflation expectations are as of this moment, as it were, uh, and there aren't inflationary pressures um, being accounted for by the markets. And that would seem to suggest that governments have a lot of capacity to continue spending, whether they're going through the formal process of issuing bonds first uh, or selling bonds directly to their, to their central bank or just engaging in crediting people's account with money outright. Um, so, in that regards, the question of uh, how are we going to pay for it now is not really that much of a constraint. The real question is what are the consequences of all of this, of all the stimulus measures as we come out of the crisis, as we start to try and return to normal activity and we need to withdraw those, uh, the, the, the exceptional support. Okay, thanks, Gwen. I might come back to you, Sue. Um, there's a question here. Um, also doing a bit of a historical comparison of spread it, uh, credit spread, sorry, um, and comparing them back to the last pandemic in, in uh, 1918. So I, I guess it's a little bit of a question of saying even though um, credit spreads are up in the 90 odd percentile, is that compelling enough or are they going get, to get worse from here? 
Um, great question because I have no direct or true answer for you. <laughs> Having not been alive in 1918 and not really lived through any of the other pandemic before, um, I think the way to think about it is, and this is where our two papers on high yield, certain, and also we, we, we include a short discussion around um, IG credit, investment grade credit in one of their papers as well, does talk to, to the fact that there is obvious potential for continued downside. Um, not even comparing to previous pandemics, because I think the economic and, and social construct these days are very different. It all boils down to what we keep saying, how long this thing will go for. Um, many businesses and companies have enough cash to sustain themselves for a period of, of time, a couple of months, maybe more, if, especially if they start reducing expenses and so forth. But very few have the ability to sustain themselves for really much more than six months without significant government assistance. And so these default, implied default rates, and as I was speaking to you, literally I just received a very good email from a fund manager telling me that um, at the moment, the, the implied default rates for high yield are probably around 10, 11%. So we're, we're assuming 10 to 11% of the high yield market will keel over, right? Won't exist anymore um, this time next year. Um, now that seems high at present because we've only been in this certain scenario for a month, but if we're doing this webinar in six months time, that does not seem so high, but that is the market as a whole. What we're saying to, to our investors is that I think that there are pockets of opportunity emerging. Not all sectors are equally affected and indeed there may be some sectors um, um, which may benefit. And that's where we're starting to look at opportunities, not on a wholesale front, we're not um, throwing money at, um, to work at, at this point, but I think we would be remiss if we weren't starting to look at opportunities, starting in high yield, as I suggested, and um, potentially looking um, into the distressed market some uh, later on. Hopefully that addresses that, that question, Kylie. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Sue. Um, this might be our last couple of questions and they're gonna come back to you on because of course you've got all of the answers on where markets are going to go from here. So one of them is asking around uh, banks and the, the view on banks, particularly if their loan books come under pressure. And the other one is around the Australian dollar and um, whether we have a view on whether it's at fair value at the moment. Uh, these, are, these are two good questions. And as Sue said, that's because I don't have good answers for them. Um, I think I haven't checked, but I have read that um, that bank, the Australian banks are down sharply today, based on the uh, new announcement coming out of New Zealand that they'll be suspending dividends for banks. And I think the UK has either done or is moving to do that. Um, obviously, that's uh, one of the main attractions for Australian banks um, for super savers. Um, and retirees is their very high dividends. And if we were to have a situation like that in Australia, I think that would be quite adverse for their share price. Uh, in terms of, in terms of the, the damage done to banks' balance sheets because of uh, very distressed loan books and so forth, um, the hope is that the very high levels of the fiscal stimulus will be able to, if not eliminate, substantially reduce that. Um, the Australian banking sector went through um, a couple of years of building up uh, equity buffers, uh, so that as I think APRA's phraseology was um, that they should be unquestionably strong. Um, and we know that there is um, not just the Australian banking system, but more generally, there is effectively, under current circumstances, um, an implicit government guarantee. On, uh, on banking balance sheets, as in we don't want to have a financial crisis in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so while I can't really say with any certainty the trajectory of share prices, um, I think that the, the outlook over the medium term uh, should not be too scary uh, for banks. Um, in terms of the Australian dollar, um, we, we went into this year being slightly, um, slightly short, and we closed that out based on a, a valuation assessment. We thought the Australian dollar had passed through fair value and was starting to look undervalued. Um, naturally, we closed out our position a couple of weeks early uh, as, the, uh, as the pandemic crisis uh, hit markets and particularly strongly hit the Australian dollar. 
Uh, part of its very pronounced sell-off was part of the dollar liquidity squeeze that Sue was talking about, when people were uh, essentially selling whatever assets they had to raise US dollars. Um, the Australian dollar fell very sharply then and has come back a fair amount from its lows. Uh, we're considering um, uh, an FX position, uh, essentially a long Australian dollar position. Um, I think it's premature for that. I think it's, um, we need to be able to see how this will play out a bit further. What are the longer term impacts, um, particularly on the Asian region and particularly on commodities before we can say with any kind of certainty what the trajectory is for the Australian dollar from here. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I hope that answers in a, an equivocating way your, uh, your question. Yeah, excellent. Um, and I think that we have exhausted all of the questions that have come through. So thank you very much, um, everyone, for your your insightful responses there. So we will call the webinar to an end, um, and hopefully you will join us all again this time next week, where uh, we'll have a similar format, except that we will be uh, joined by Shannon Riley, our uh, equity portfolio manager, and we'll be looking a little bit more closely at the equity markets uh, and managers in that space as well. In the meantime, please stay safe, um, make sure we're keeping our distance, and um, we look forward to talking to you again next week. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.